Do you think, however, in ethene, drawn here again, we have the carbons, three hybridized orbitals, and one unhybridized orbital. Here's the sigma bond, and here's the pi bond to give you the double bond. You think that these two orbitals, now that they overlap, and they have one electron in them each, so now they overlap and put two electrons in that bond, do you think then that this orbital still can, has its same character, and this one does too, and they really just overlap and electrons are shared in an overlap area? Probably not. So even hybridization doesn't really explain stuff really well. No kidding. So, yeah, we probably have just one honking big orbital that actually contains the electrons in it, in the molecule. So we call it a molecular orbital. And molecular orbitals actually help us to define not only where the electrons might be, but look at this. You know that that was one orbital and that was another, that's two orbitals. Well, each orbital can, can hold two electrons, so you know when these two come together and they're sharing two electrons, really you could cram four electrons into that double now orbital, which is what the molecular orbital is. Molecular orbitals with their bonding and antibonding areas, this is the bonding area, where would you put electrons now if you're trying to cram them in here? You'd have to put them into positions that weren't in between the nuclei because you already got enough electrons here to cause too many repulsions. This molecular orbital can extend, oh, I don't know, let's say to the back of this carbon uh, and each of these carbons. So then you can put electrons into anti-bonding positions, which actually require more energy than putting them between the nuclei where the energy is lowest. Woo! Okay, so here's what the energy level diagram might look like when two elements come together to bond. Here's kind of a mini graph. Energy is going up, don't worry about the H2 there. Energy is going up and we've got levels. Here's a low level of energy and here's a higher level of energy. Okay, now let's take a hydrogen atom and a hydrogen atom and bring them together to bond them together. Now you know that hydrogen is 1s1 and here's another hydrogen over here and it's 1s1 as well. So when they come together, their orbitals are going to overlap, form that molecular orbital and the electrons, remember, we get two electrons to form a bond. One electron and another electron are actually going to go into a low energy position to form a bond. One electron from one combines with another electron from another. Now this level is filled with as many electrons as we can have in this sigma bond of the 1s. And so a low energy position is attained when two hydrogens come together. Energy is released. Low energy position for H2. Now, look at Is there such a thing as H2 with a negative one charge? Well, how many electrons would that have? It would have three electrons total. How do you account for all that? Okay, if the two atoms come together, two electrons are going to bond together, me and the bond, and that's going to be in the sigma orbitals, which are going to then hybridize, right? But then there's one electron left. Where does it go? It can't go in between the two nuclei because now we've got hydrogen here and hydrogen here. You've got already two electrons in there, cramming another one in there. Too many repulsions. One spinning one way, one spinning the other, and the other one is just disturbing the whole lot. So the other one has to go into an antibonding orbital somewhere else in the molecule. And that antibonding orbital is a high energy type of orbital. So it would go here. But because we have, in terms of the number of electrons in the bonding orbital, which is 2. We only have 1 in the anti-bonding orbital, which is 1. And then we divide by 2 because any orbital has 2 electrons in it. This gives you, actually, a number that is 1 half. 2 minus 1 is 1, divided by 2 is 1 half. It's positive 1 half. And ladies and gentlemen, when we take the number of bonding electrons, and subtract the antibonding, that's what that little asterisk means, antibonding electrons that are in the higher energy, and we get a number greater than zero for its bond order, that's what that number represents, then the molecule can exist. H2 negative actually exists. But how about 
this. If we had He2, is there such a thing as diatomic helium? Does helium bond, right? Okay, well, helium's got, helium has got two electrons in its 1s orbital. When these two atoms come together, two of the electrons go into the bonding orbital. Where do the other two go? They have to go into the anti-bonding orbital. And so, one, two, three, four, you've accounted for all the valence electrons of helium, all the electrons it has. Hey, you've got two bonding and two anti-bonding, two electrons per orbital, you're dividing by two, so the bond order calculation is always bonding minus anti-bonding divided by two, you get zero. And when you get zero, you can't do it. So that means that helium, He2, diatomic, is not possible. And it's a noble gas, so it doesn't bond. It makes sense. Hey, molecular, molecular orbital energy level diagrams are actually kind of cool. Complicated, but cool.